Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Jake. I'm a third year medical student and today I'm gonna to be showing you how I approach any question on the USMLE. Now this not only applies for the USMLE, but any multiple choice question that you'll encounter as a med student, whether it be your shelf exams, whether it be while you're going through UWorld blocks, etc. cetera. Um, but today I've picked four questions from the free 120, the MBME free 120. And I picked four distinct questions, four different styles of questions to show you just how I approach any question, how I break down the vignettes and how I isolate the correct answer for any question that I come across. And so the four types of questions that I'll be going through with you today is number one, my general approach to questions. Number two, I'm gonna be going through a lab value based question. Number three, I'm gonna be taking you through a diagram and figure question. And then finally, number four, I'm gonna be finishing off with an arrow based question. So without further ado, Let's dive into the questions. So the first thing I do is read the last sentence of the vignette. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's physical findings? Okay, so this is a first order question. We're looking for the diagnosis and cause. So let's read. We have a five-year-old boy brought to the ED by his mother because of an episode of bloody stool three hours ago. Okay, so we have the chief complaint, five-year-old ED, bloody stool three hours ago, and we're given an acute timeline. The mother says the stool was hard like pebbles and she noted bright red blood on the tissue when the patient cleaned himself. Okay, a little bit more background into the consistency in the examination finding. His previous bowel movement was five days ago. Okay, so quite a significant duration from the last uh, bowel movement is, is gonna be important here. The patient has no abdominal or rectal pain now, but did have abdominal pain during his bowel movement five days ago. Okay, so possibly some straining uh, involved, some pain. He has no history of major medical illness and receives no medications. Okay, so they're throwing in these pertinent negatives to maybe rule down a chronic medical condition or medication-induced bleeding. Vaccinations are up to date, so we have another protective factor against uh, certain things. The patient has no recent history of travel, again, ruling down some sort of bugs or uh, viruses, illnesses, parasites that you might be able to acquire overseas. He's at the 5th percentile of height, 10th percentile for weight, and BMI is in the 50th percentile, so it gives us a little bit about growth and development. Vitals are within normal limits. Okay, they're telling us this to maybe rule down an infectious etiology. Abdominal examination shows hypoactive bowel sounds and a soft, slightly distended abdomen that is not tender to palpation. Okay, so now we're given the physical exam findings. Rectal examination shows one centimeter of bright rectal mucosa protruding from the right side of the anus. There is no rectal bleeding. The remainder of the examination shows no abnormality. So before we dive into the answer choice right away, I wanna show you a strategy that you can use if you're confused at this stage. Let's say you just read this whole vignette, you don't really know what's going on, you don't have a clear diagnosis or cause in your head, well, you're gonna use this strategy that's gonna really help. So let's work from the bottom up and use process of elimination. Okay, into susception. Starting with intussusception, we know that causes what? A colicky pain, right? That can often also cause vomiting, our dark red currant jelly stools, right? In our vignette here, we have a bright red blood uh, from the stool. So that's, that's not very in keeping, right? So we could probably rule this one down. For hookworm infestation, well, there's no recent history of travel, vitals are normal, so I'm definitely thinking that's lower on our differential list. Hirschsprung's disease. Well, we know that can present with failure to pass meconium, but in a different timeline, right? Usually that's within the first 48 hours of life, right? Remember the associations with Down syndrome, the RET mutation, the positive squirt sign, right? And so Hirschsprung's disease typically presents right after birth. And so this is not in keeping with a five-year-old boy who's having bright red bloody stools, okay? Next, cystic fibrosis. We know cystic fibrosis has systemic manifestations, right? It affects the lungs, it affects the pancreas. And so you'd expect to see recurrent uh, sinopulmonary infections. You'd expect to see failure to thrive, right? When they give you a little bit about their background uh, developmental history. Also, you'd expect to see perhaps some pancreatic insufficiency, right? With your fat soluble vitamin deficiencies and steatorrhea. We don't see any of that, so I'm ruling that down as well. And so now we've arrived at constipation A. And so I just wanted to show you that, you know, you can work backwards and go this way if you're not really sure right off the bat. But if we do have a look at the symptoms here and the constellation of signs that the vignette provides us with, it is pretty in keeping with constipation, right? We have the consistency of the stool, right? The hard like pebbles. We have the bright red tissue, which is a sequelae of constipation, right? And we have a bit of a time frame. So pain on bowel movement five days ago. Um, the last bowel movement was five days ago. And so what can happen is with chronic constipation, right? You increase intra-abdominal pressure and that can lead to things like hemorrhoids, fissures, rectal prolapse. Specifically in this case, right? Rectal examination shows one centimeter of rectal mucosa. 
That's in keeping with our rectal prolapse, which again is a sequelae of constipation. So that would be our correct answer for this vignette. So I hope this breakdown was helpful and you can see how applying these general principles to any question stem can really help. And using this process of elimination, if you're stuck, can also be a way to get to the right answer. But in these next vignettes, I wanna go over some more specific style questions, and we're gonna kick it off with our lab value question. Now this next question is a lab value type question, so let's get into it. So again, applying our general principles, read the last sentence. This patient most likely has antibodies directed against which of the following antigens? Okay, so now we have a second order question. We need to identify from the vignette the diagnosis, and then we need to know what antibodies are directed against the following antigens. Okay, so let's read. 32 year old man, comes to the office because of a one day history of cough productive of small amounts of blood, hemoptysis, and two day history of shortness of breath and swelling in his ankles. Okay, so already we have some sort of pulmonary involvement to this presentation. He also has a two week history of progressive fatigue and episodes of dark urine. Hmm, okay, so maybe we have some renal involvement now. He has no history of major medical illness and takes no medications, pertinent negatives. His temperature is 37, so he's not febrile. Pulse is 90, respirations are 18, and blood pressure is 175 over 110. Okay, so he is hypertensive. Again, maybe related to the renal involvement. Pulse ox on room air shows an oxygen saturation of 91%. Okay, so he's hypoxemic. Diffuse inspiratory crackles are heard all over the lung bases. More pulmonary involvement. There is two plus pitting edema of both ankles. Okay, so we're now maybe thinking some sort of volume overload state. Now we have the lab values and let's dive into it. So how I approach this is I pull up the lab values tab right here and I go one by one. So first let's start off with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, we're a 32 year old male. We look for male here, 13 to 17. Okay, so we are low and our hematocrit is also low. So this is in keeping with some sort of anemia, right? We've lost blood. Next, let's go into the serum values. So we have urea nitrogen which is elevated and creatinine, which is elevated. So we're having problems excreting these waste products. This is in keeping with an acute kidney injury. And finally, we're given there's urine RBCs. So the presence of red blood cell casts, that's pretty pathognomonic for some sort of nephritic syndrome, some sort of damage maybe to the glomerulus, right? Mm -hmm. And then the stem will continue to say, urinalysis also shows some dysmorphic RBCs in rare RBC casts. Okay, so again, in keeping with this renal involvement, some sort of nephritic picture. And now it's saying examination of kidney biopsy specimen shows crescenteric glomerular nephritis and linear deposition of IgG along the glomerular capillaries. Okay, so now we're giving specifics on the biopsy to help us differentiate the different nephritic syndromes in our head. Now, all of this in keeping, right, the pulmonary involvement, the renal involvement, and this nephritic syndrome, specifically this crescenteric glomerular nephritis and linear deposition of IgG, this is in keeping with our good pasture syndrome, which is a type two hypersensitivity, right? Autoantibodies against the basement membrane, which is made up of collagen, type four collagen. And so these autoantibodies, right, direct affect the renal uh, structures, right, the glomerulus, as well as the pulmonary vasculature, which is why you get this hemoptysis and this uh, nephritic picture. And so collagen is, I'm thinking, probably our most likely answer here. But again, let's play the game where you don't know that it's good pasture right off the bat, or maybe you don't know the pathogenesis or the pathophysiology of this autoantibodies to the type four collagen. So let's go through the other ones. Double-stranded DNA, that antibody is, is implicated with, uh, it's a sensitive marker for lupus, and lupus can present with a nephritic syndrome. However, you would expect to see the other constellation and symptomology of lupus, right? The malar rash, the uh, aptus ulcers, the arthralgias, and the fatigue, right? None of which we see here. Nucleolar uh, protein is your double-stranded uh, DNA, which is also a marker implicated um, in SLE. It's a more specific marker, but again, doesn't fall in line with um, our presentation here. Phospholipids or anti-phospholipid antibodies, right? That's our anti-phospholipid syndrome. Um, that's an autoimmune condition uh, that causes recurrent clots, thrombosis, and classically in the vignettes, they'll often present a patient with recurrent miscarriages. Again, not in keeping with this. And then finally, proteins in the neutrophil cytoplasm, those are our ANCAs, right? These are more uh, implicated with our small vessel vasculitis, for instance. But again, you wouldn't expect to see this um, linear deposition of IgG or crescenteric glomerular nephritis. So again, that would make collagen our best answer. So I hope this was helpful. Again, particularly, I want to focus on the lab values here. Go one by one. 
highlight the abnormalities, and understand the implications and how it ties in to the rest of the vignette. Now let's dive into a diagram figure style question. Now, the first thing guys, don't freak out. We're gonna go through this step by step, but I want you to first identify your Y and X axis. So on our, along our Y axis here, we have cardiac output, right? We know cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped from our heart each minute. On our X axis here, we have our end diastolic volume. We know diastole is the relaxation of the heart and end diastolic volume, right? Would be the amount of volume of blood in the heart at the end of diastole, at the end of filling. Now with this being said, let's now dive into the vignette. So we have a 65 year old woman brought to the ED because of a 10 minute history of chest tightness and severe pain of the left arm. Okay, maybe sounds like some sort of uh, myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction. Physical examination shows jugular venous distension. Okay, maybe this progresses to some sort of right-sided failure. Crackles are heard over the lung fields. Okay, also in keeping with this volume overload state. An ECG shows ST segment elevation greater than one millimeter in V's V4 through V6 and new Q waves. Okay, so all these ECG findings are in keeping of a myocardial infarction. V4 through 6 is going to be your left anterior descending artery and left circumflex artery, but that's not gonna be important for this vignette, just some added info for you guys. Serum studies show an increased troponin I concentration. Okay, so this is, again is a specific marker. Which of the following labeled points in the graph best represents the changes in cardiac function that occurred during the first 10 seconds after the onset of this patient? Okay, so now let's turn our heads back to the graph. So we have a picture of acute myocardial infarction ischemia. Now, if there's a decreased oxygen supply to the ventricle, right? The ventricle is gonna have problem contracting, right? Remember that decreased oxygen, decreased ATP, decreased contractility. So if we have decreased contractility of our ventricle, let's work through what we can expect to see in both these variables. So for cardiac output, we said that that's the amount of blood ejected, right, from our heart each minute. If our heart's not contracting well, right, in a, in a picture of, of myocardial infarction, do you think our cardiac output's gonna go up or down? Probably gonna go down, right? So we know that our first point has to go from up to down. So our y-axis has to go down. Next, our end diastolic volume. Now, if our heart's not contracting well, right? If it's not ejecting blood as efficient as it can, then do you think our end diastolic volume is gonna go up or down? The amount of blood remaining in the, in the heart, right? After filling, if it's not pumping out blood too well forward, it's probably gonna have more blood accumulating there, right? So we're gonna have a higher end diastolic volume. And that means our x-axis is gonna have to move to the right to increase. So we are looking now for the answer choices, right? We're looking for a letter that goes down and to the right. So the only pattern that goes down to the right is W to Z, down to right, W to Z, which would make C our correct answer. So I hope that helped you guys and you see how to approach this style of question. I don't want you guys to stress when you see diagrams or figures, just go through it systematically, go through your y-axis, go through your x-axis, Think just in general terms what you'd expect to see, how the relationship of these two variables interact with one another, and then use the vignette, right, to help guide what's going on and to help guide uh, the, the, the presentation. So hope that helped and let's dive into the last one. Now for our last one, how to approach an arrow style question. Let's dive into it. Following the same general principles, let's read the last sentence. Which of the following changes in serum lab values is most likely present in this patient? We have sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb. All right, let's read the vignette. You have a 30 year old woman evaluated for a three month history of progressive fatigue, decreased appetite, and weight loss. All right, so some non-specific constitutional signs, but a three month chronic course, let's keep that in mind. The patient has type one diabetes and has noticed decreased insulin requirements over this time. Okay, so maybe some sort of autoimmune etiology here. She has no other medical conditions and does not use tobacco, alcohol, or illicit drugs, some pertinent negatives. Physical exam shows a generalized increase in pigmentation of the skin, especially involving the palmar creases. Hmm, okay, that's maybe a sign of something. Measurement of serum cortisol, serum cortisol from our, our adrenals, right? Before and after administration of exogenous ACTH shows no difference in the levels. Okay, so you're now probably thinking some sort of adrenal or pituitary or hypothalamic related condition, right? Our primary, secondary, or tertiary adrenal insufficiency and we do this ACTH stimulation test to see what level the problem's at, right? And so the findings here show that the serum cortisol show no difference when we have ACTH stimulation. And a reminder that ACTH normally comes from our anterior pituitary and that's gonna stimulate our adrenal to secrete cortisol. 
Now, if we administer this exogenous ACTH and we're not seeing changes in cortisol, then that most likely means there's a problem in the adrenal itself, right? The adrenal cannot produce cortisol. So this would point us towards a primary adrenal insufficiency where the problem is at the adrenal level itself. And now if we think about the roles of the adrenal, remember the three layers, right? You have GFR, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis. In particular, salt, sugar, sex, right, is, is, the, is the order. And our mineral corticoids, right, our salt, our, our aldosterone, for instance, is a key mineral corticoid, which has effects on many of these electrolytes. And if you remember, right, aldosterone's role is to increase sodium reabsorption and then dump and secrete hydrogen and potassium. And so if you've identified all these features now, you could probably go to the arrows. Now, the first thing I want you to do when you're seeing arrows is pick the low hanging fruit. And what that means is in this case, well, sodium, right? We know that aldosterone has a role in reabsorbing sodium. So sodium can't be normal if there's a problem here. So our low hanging fruit is this column here. So we know automatically, right? That A and D can be crossed out our low hanging fruit, okay? Now let's think about what else aldosterone does to differentiate between B and C. We said that aldosterone will secrete potassium and secrete hydrogen ions, right? And so if there's a problem with that, if there's an underproduction of aldosterone, we'd expect to see the opposite, right? And so if we're not secreting potassium, right, our potassium is going to have higher levels in the body and we're probably thinking this one here, B and not C. And just for completeness sake, right, a reminder that aldosterone also dumps hydrogen ions and every time it dumps a hydrogen ion, it resorbs bicarb. If it fails to resorb bicarb, right, now we're not resorbing it, it's dumping out and we get low levels of bicarb. And finally, you don't need to know this for this question to answer it because the answer is in fact B. But if you just wanted to know from an educational standpoint why chloride is high, there's a something called electro neutrality. And all of our cells in our body want to maintain a balance between our cations and anions. And so bicarbonate, which is an anion, right? HCO3 minus. If we lose HCO3 minus, right? And we're losing a lot of this negative anion, the body's gonna do whatever it can to resorb to increase another negative uh, ion, right? Which is our chloride, our Cl minus. And so that's why you can expect to see chloride going up. And just coming back here to the increase in pigmentation as well, which was a sign of Addison's disease, right? Primary adrenal insufficiency. A reminder that if cortisol, right, is decreased, is low in primary adrenal um, sufficiency because we're not getting proper production, then we don't have a negative feedback system going back to the pituitary, the anterior pituitary. So our anterior pituitary is going to go crazy and keep stimulating and producing ACTH because it's trying to, it's trying, it's trying to produce this cortisol. Well, simultaneously, it produces something called MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. And this increases pigmentation and causes this classic um, increased pigmentation in Addison's disease. And so I hope that helped. Just a quick breakdown. Remember, pick your low hanging fruit, go for that first, and then try to isolate out the other variables with reason correspondence with the vignette. So that's it for this question and uh, hope it helped guide you through style of questions like this. That's it for me, everyone. Thanks for watching. I really hope today you learned a lot about how to approach vignettes and you can apply some of the strategies and tips that I showed you today in your daily study and as you go through question blocks, uh, NBMEs, etc. cetera. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Subscribe if you want more content like this. And as always, study smarter, not harder. We'll see you next time.